Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise All right. By the time this thing wears out, I'm going to learn how to use it. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. We might, uh, we might, uh, probably going to have to run off some more copies tonight. Thank you, Jesus. I love it when I have to run off more. Hallelujah. We might have to expand Seniors Night just a little bit, get two or three more specials in there. I like them. Amen. Amen. I like that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing amongst us. Amen. If you all will stay with me tonight, and I don't run a bunch of people off, and uh, uh, if... Uh, uh, I can keep from going way too long, so you stay. We're going to baptize Brother Mark and Brother Greg in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. Right. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? Yeah. Amen. I can't think of two I'd rather break those new robes in on than them two. Amen. And I'll tell you what, I have a, I have a, 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 a testimony to share that that ties in. Brother Mark got a bad report at the doctor the other day and it having to do with his kidneys and nothing, nothing just right this minute, but they anticipate some bad things down the road. And I, uh, I believe it's Brother Foss's book that I read that uh, said the night that he got baptized, he had pneumonia. And it was one of those nights that they had to break the ice to baptize people. Do any of y'all remember them nights? I, I don't remember them, thank the Lord. I've heard about them. But everybody around there told him, you need to wait. Brother Pete, they said, you need to wait. You're, gonna, you're already bad sick. You need, don't need to get baptized now. You need to wait till later because you're going you're gonna to end up dead. And he said, I'm getting baptized tonight. And he went down in that icy water, cold, sick, coughing, running a fever, came up out of the water completely healed and never had another touch of pneumonia for the rest of his life. So, hey, I'm just believing that when he comes out of the water, that not only can God fill him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but he can heal his body. I believe it. I believe it. It's that name. It's that name. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name. And it's him... The name, there's been other people named Jesus, but there's only been one that died for our sins, that shed his life's blood that we might live. Amen. Guess I was wrong. I guess I got enough copies. Just exactly enough. That disappoints me. I wanted to be off. No, I'm just teasing. That's great. I, I made 40 copies and we gave out 40, and so that means we got 50-something here tonight and, uh, Amen. A few, few Sunday nights ago, I counted them, and we had 70 some out here on a Sunday night. Boy, I was thrilled to death with that. I think it was 72 that we had here, and I'm thrilled to death with it. Tonight, tonight we will end our uh, teaching on praying through the tabernacle. In listening to Brother Mangan's teaching and praying about it today, I had to go to Cape this morning. I listened to it on the way up there. I listened to it on the way home. I stopped it occasionally, and I even did some research while I was waiting today. And then I came home, and I studied some more and listened some more, and I am forever more convinced that if we will do this, that our walk with God will be more effective than it's ever been. I can already tell you that it's made a difference in my life. It's made a difference in my mood. It's made a difference in the way things affect me. 
It's made a difference in my worrying. Because I'm by nature a worrying type person. But Brother David, it's made a difference without even trying. It's made a difference in me as I begin to try to be perfected in prayer. Exodus 25. We'll read 10 through 11, then 16, 17, and 18, and then 21 and 22. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. Verse 16 says, And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there, everybody say there, I will meet thee, I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Somebody tell me the reason why the tabernacle was implemented. He did, he did. He did. But I came to a little bit of a revelation today. And I, I, hope, I hope through this, and you're both right. You're both right. But there's a one-word answer to the ultimate reason why they needed the tabernacle. Well, you're getting close. Getting really close. It's probably not going to be what you think. I want to be able, I've been thinking because it has been such a battle uh, in the spirit to try to teach this. And it's been very strange because I feel the anointing in an unbelievable way. The Holy Ghost has moved brilliantly. But yet it's because of, uh, and it, it is because of, it's out of our comfort zone. It's why that it's been difficult. It is, it is unfamiliar to us. It is out of our comfort zone. And I think if we be frank, and, and I had a conversation with mom the other night that shed a little bit of light on it. it. It can be, it can be, especially to somebody that's lived for God for a number of years, it can be just a touch insulting to insinuate that maybe there's a better way to pray than what we've prayed. And I feel that. I feel that. And the thing is, is that's okay. It's all right. Because just because it makes us uncomfortable does not mean it's wrong. Being a little uncomfortable is good. The Bible says, I guess I might need to preach a few minutes before I go to teach it. The Bible says, woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. That is those that sit back and think, I've got it all figured out. Oh, God help me. My Lord have mercy. Hmm. Ooh. The whole reason for the tabernacle ultimately was sin. Everybody needed the tabernacle because of sin. Brother David, you're right in that he made it as a gathering place, as a, as a place where he could commune. But the reason why he had to make a place is because they sinned in the beginning, Brother Pete. It was sin that brought in the need for the Lord to have to make a way for people to want to be with him. Before sin, he just showed up. Sometimes in the cool of the day. 
just with a desire to be with his creation. Everybody, everybody say everybody. Now, I got to tell you one thing. I got thrilled to death today when I was listening to Brother Mangan pre preach this at his church. Because Brother Terry, you know what he did? After he, he said something really good and you could hear people clapping. And then he said, there's a whole bunch of you that ain't clapping. And I thought, yes. <laughs> yes. Because you know what that told me? It happens there, there too. Everybody needed the tabernacle because of sin. Everybody. The plan was put into place to restore the relationship that sin had destroyed. It was not a just in case you sin. It was a because you will sin. Sin is an ever-present enemy that we have to be aware of. And it will be an ever-present enemy until this corruptible shall put on incorruption. Can I get a witness up in here? It will be a problem until Jesus comes. Lest we think we have arrived, lest we think that the, we're about to be translated like Enoch was or caught up in a whirlwind like Elijah was, rest assured, you need the Lord. You need a relationship with him, and you need help. God, help me right now. You need help getting there. We cannot get there on our own. We need help. And so he made a tabernacle. He made a tabernacle. Consequently, the presence of the mercy seat, because everybody needed it. We all need mercy. And we all need a visitation with God upon the mercy seat. Because the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We need mercy. I need mercy. The world needs mercy. The very presence of the tabernacle's plan says that we cannot follow the commandments of God by ourselves. Shortly after giving the commandments, he implemented the atonement, the atonement by sacrificial shedding of blood as a substitutionary death. Because without the shedding of blood, if there wasn't going to be sin, he would have never implemented the plan with the blood. He knew what we would do when left to ourselves. Or else that everybody that sinned, without the sacrifice, everybody that sinned would die. You or I couldn't be saved without Calvary. The blood that Jesus shed washes away our sins and its effectiveness is forever. Without the blood, there is or was or never will be any hope. It's the blood that gives us hope. The blood of Jesus Christ. James 4 and 8 says, Draw nigh to God in part. I'm not going to quote the whole part because I didn't want to go there tonight. The part that says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. I didn't want to do that. Though I will tell you that that was written to the church. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Brother David, I began to ponder on that scripture. I began to think about that scripture. You think about it while I'm talking. This is a portion of scripture that describes what we should be trying to do until either we die or Jesus comes. Notice, the scripture says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. I have always pictured that as kind of like a little bit of a delayed reaction on the part of God. He would see me way over here begin to creep toward him, Brother Pete, 
And automatically, he would begin to say, oh, they're moving. Well, I better move too. We must first draw near to him. Then he will draw near to us. This totally obliterates the idea that you can live however you want to and grace will save you. Grace only kicks in when we've gone as far as we can go. That's when grace kicks in. We must, in order to draw near to God, leave where we are. With the intention, notice it, Brother Pete, that it's not an aimless, just haphazard, dilly-dallying around, but it is an intentional drawing closer to God. I want to go where He is. I'm not just going to, you know, start pumping this up and when it explodes, I'll be with the Lord. But I must leave where I am in order to get where he is. Then somebody might say, well, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He is. He is everywhere. For saints and sinners all. He's everywhere. You just want to talk about him as, a, as an abstract being. He's omniscient and omnipresent. But there is a place that we can go in him that you just don't fall out of bed in the morning and wake up there. This prayer pattern is designed following a pattern from heaven for us to draw near to God. And as you pray this pattern, you will feel yourself drawing near to him. Now I want you to understand this. You will feel yourself drawing near to him both in that particular instant, that particular prayer journey, and also in your everyday life. You will feel stronger right that minute, but then you will also feel yourself growing in the Lord. It will culminate. This journey will culminate. It will end with us reaching the Holy of Holies. Think about it. Brother David, because he said, it is here, it is there that I will. I don't, I don't think we can quite grasp a hold of that. We, you hear me right now, you hear me. I'm in the Holy Ghost. I know this works. I've put it to the test. I know it works. Many of us, our entire lives, have been happy just drawing near to God. And not meet me. Now if that opposition that I felt was going to discourage me. I'd have quit teaching this. I ain't discouraged. Because I know it works. It is here. That we meet him. As I offer praise. Enter to his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. As I repent at the place of slaughter, at the altar of sacrifice, as I am washed in the water of his word, renew myself in the spirit at the golden candlestick. Enter the holy place reflecting upon his name and his attributes, which are wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father and the prince of peace to effectively burn with the fire of the Holy Ghost, cutting the wicks on the candlestick in order to burn pure, eating the Word of God for sustenance and growth, and praying for those that handle and deliver the Word. And then at the altar of incense, I intercede for others. I pray and worship God. This is where I offer my request unto the Lord as I approach the Holy of Holies. And now I will enter into the Holy of Holies. See the pattern? I draw near to him. He draws near to me. And it is here in the Holy of Holies where we will meet. It is here where we will meet. 
It is here that I will find fulfillment as a true blue apostolic, as a true blue Christian. The Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of Testimony was the first piece of furniture that God gave instructions for. When the tabernacle was complete, the Ark was then placed in the Holy of Holies. It was the Ark of the Covenant that separated this tabernacle from other similar structures. And if you do your research, you'll find that these structures were not few. It was a common practice to make a portable place of worship among those in the Oriental world. No one else, nowhere else on the face of planet Earth could one be guaranteed to meet the Lord face to face. The supernatural, divine, heavenly, beautiful presence of the Lord was guaranteed to be in this place, a place designed by God and built by man. I said a place designed by God, but built by man. All the places we've been are good, but none can compare to the ark and the holy of holies. Sometimes when you pray this pattern, you will pray through till you talk in tongues right at the very beginning. You begin to praise him and you'll feel his presence pour out on you. Sometimes it'll be at the altar of incense. Sometimes it'll be when you start talking about how wonderful he is and how great his counsel is and how he's the mighty God and the everlasting Father and you feel that peace that comes from the Prince of Peace. There are various places where you'll get a breakthrough or you'll get into the Spirit or you'll get into the presence of the Lord. But none of those can compare to the experience of being in the Holy of Holies and meeting him. Remember, saints of God, remember, there are things he has promised. There are signs and wonders the Bible declares that we're not seeing. When we go into the presence of the Lord, we don't go as Pastor Keen. We don't go as youth pastor. We don't go as Sunday school teacher. We don't go as a piano player or a bass player or a drummer. We don't go with a title or anything that might represent our accomplishments or our identity. We go into the presence of the Lord as a once defiled vessel who has been cleansed by the power of God and by only the power of God. Grateful, thankful, and humbled down under the mighty hand of God. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Here we desire to become one with him to become lost in the presence of the Lord. There is no spiritual warfare here. There is no sacrifice here. This is about intimacy. This is about relationship. This is not a place to wring his arm, to tug on his coat and beg for things. But this is the place where we are restored to the relationship that he desires to have. When our relationship with God starts fading and we find ourselves in a backslidden condition, it does not fade from the outer court in. It fades from the holy of holies out. Your intimate walk with God has decreased. Just as he draws near to us when we draw near to him, as we draw away from him, he also draws away from us. We cannot be here in the presence of the Lord, bringing our backpacks and sleeping bags, our snacks and video games, our TVs and computers don't belong here. We can't go here with bitterness and guile in our hearts. We're not coming here with baggage. We're bringing nothing but ourselves. We are his workmanship. We are from above and not from beneath. We are the apple of his eye. And I find these descriptions of us in scripture. They're given by the word of God. This is not how I view myself, but this is how he views me. He wants us and he wants us completely. He wants us completely. In the Ark of the Covenant, there were some items. He referred to them 
as the testimony that I shall give you. There are things in the Ark of the Covenant that testified to the people of God. The first thing is the tablets of stone upon which was written the Ten Commandments. Representing the law of God. A law that must be kept. A clearly defined directive to live in an abundant life while being pleasing to God. The scripture tells us he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Yet it's important to note that the commandments are covered by the mercy seat. They testify of God's mercy toward everyone who has broken his commandments. And when the blood is applied, those sins are forgotten. It is in this place where we are reminded of the commandments and of the times that we know we've broken them. But he hasn't held it against us. Sin, past sins that are not under the blood cannot keep you out of the presence of the Lord. So somebody hear me not tonight. If you've got them under the blood, leave them under the blood. When the Lord looks at you, he does not see your sin. He just sees the blood. He hasn't held our past misfortunes, misdeeds, mistakes, or outright blatant sins against us. But we're reminded when we see the commandments under the mercy seat. We're reminded of our freedom from the power of sin. The golden pot of manna that says God is here to supply your needs. That he will take care of his people. It is in the holy of holies that he testifies of his care and concern and his awareness of us and our needs. It's here that we cease to worry about the things we need because God will supply. Don't nobody come up to me after church and feel sorry for me for what I'm about to tell you, okay? I went to the doctor today, been having a few little problems. First thing he told me, he said, I don't think you got anything wrong, which thank the Lord for that. He told me to get off my blood pressure medicine. He said, you don't need it. I took it for a week. My blood pressure dropped down too much. I've been having a few problems and I was scared. I'm talking about a place that you can go in the Lord where the Holy Ghost will minister to you. Brother Billy, I'm not talking about just the same thing everybody does. Just going through the motions. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost speaking into your life. When I got to the table of shoe bread the other morning I began to read a passage Brother McKinney I read it two days in a row in its entirety verse for verse never even noticed the end of it Brother David because I was focused on something else well looks like may not be here no more I'm not joking. No, there it is. I've been having a few issues with my heart. Lay down at night and it flutters a little bit and stuff. My triglycerides are up a little bit. And so, Brother Billy, I'm reading the Word of God. I just want to minister to you tonight. I just want to minister to you and tell you that it works. God's for me, Brother Pete. God is for me. And all of those things that he tells us in the book, those are things he wants us to do. He, he, I'm telling you, the Lord will minister to you. Get this. I was getting a little bit chicken. I even been teasing with my family. 
I go to bed at night. Baby, if I don't wake up in the morning, I love you. And then I get smacked. <laughs> or something. But it's been in the back of my mind. We're just humans. Right? So, Brother McKinney, I, I, I'm praying. I've even prayed, Lord, if something ha- if it's your will, something happens to me, watch out for my wife and my kids and, and watch out for this church. And, and I, I pray, I, I mean, we just got to be real. We're, we're, we're mortals. And I, I want the will of God. The last three verses, one, two, three, four. The last four verses of Psalm 27. It says, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Which fear is your enemy, by the way, in case you was wondering. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Get this. I had fainted unless... If I hadn't believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now here's the deal. That may not mean to you what it did to me. But I felt the power of the Holy Ghost burst over me. And it was like the Lord said, listen, you're going to see the goodness of the Lord Not in a heavenly place, but in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, it says. Be of good courage. And he shall... I ain't lying to you. What's it say right there? I'll take it, brother. You think that's an accident? Who am I that you're mindful of me? That's just the Lord saying, I got my eyes on you. That's just the Lord saying, keep on. Keep on. You're going to see it. Just don't be afraid. I'm going to strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. If you don't think he's mindful of us, oh, he's mindful of us. He's here. And he's wanting to meet me. He's wanting to meet me. God's here to supply your needs, the golden pot of manna says. Worry is one of the greatest enemies of revival. Worry is one of the greatest enemies of you being blessed. If you've got $20 in your pocketbook and you've got it designated for something and the Holy Ghost says give it, you'd be too afraid to give it if you're worried. If you're in the presence of the Lord, you'll give 40 if he says 20 I wish somebody would listen, get a hold of this, what I'm teaching, what I'm preaching to you tonight. That's the way it works. Because, Brother Pete, my confidence is in him. And the manna, the manna is evidence that I'm going to take care of you. You just brought us out here to let us die. No, I didn't. Wait till you wake up in the morning. There's blessings. Is there anybody in the house that you'd like to be free from worrying? That you'd like to be free from, 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 from being always perplexed about everything? If you get your way into the Holy of Holies, uh, he'll deliver you from it. Why can't... My God, have mercy. You see a commercial that there's a new kind of detergent... Or you hear something about a new kind of detergent that's guaranteed to guarantee to take out spots? People will line up by the droves. You see, every one of them getting it. But I'm talking about something that will change your life forever. 
that will change your life forever, that will bring victory, that will bring miracles, that will bring signs and wonders into your life. And people look at me skeptical. The thing is, some of us, what do we got to lose? I have to hold myself in sometimes in Bible study from just not running the aisles. Because y'all think I'm crazy. It's here that we cease to worry about the things we need. Because we truly believe that my God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Oh. Oh. And then the third thing is Aaron's rod that budded. That represents authority. And that represents the miraculous. It represents the supernatural power of God that will minister to you in the presence of your enemies. That the plan of God will be manifest. That the cry of God's people will never go unnoticed. But I want you to notice something else. It represents life out of death. A staff is a dead piece of wood. It is not connected to roots. Therefore, it cannot grow. It is big as it will ever get. But Aaron's staff, his walking stick, his shepherd's staff, maybe that he copied off his brother, Aaron's staff began to bloom and began to bud. It is representative of the power of the resurrection. It is represented that life will come out of death. It is representative that even if it's cut off and hopeless, uh, that the power of the Holy Ghost uh, can bring life. I fear that in many of our prayer lives, uh, and I'm going to testify to you, there have been sporadic occasions throughout my life with God, throughout my walk with God. Looking back now, there have been just isolated instances uh, where I found myself where I'm teaching about tonight, Brother Pete. But it was usually precipitated by a burden or it was precipitated by a strong desire or it was precipitated by something that was happening in my life right then. Never have I been to the place where I just, that I just wake up in the morning planning on being with Jesus just as fast as I can get there. Planning on a rendezvous with the master. Because it's a way of life, not because all hells come against me, just because I want to be with him. And what's better, what's better, Brother Billy, he wants to be with me. Y'all just well hold on to your seats because it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. We're going to the Holy of Holies. Diligent people, good people, faithful people. But because of a failure to recognize that there is more, handicapped, handicapped by short expectations, handicapped by low self-esteem and low self-image, Failing to recognize that there is more. He's drawing near. We cannot be satisfied with a look. Brother David, we cannot be satisfied with a souvenir like the children of Israel were. They said, it is a great land. It flows with milk and honey. Oh, Holy Ghost, come on now. It is a great land. It's everything he said it was. The promises are there. And we even brought back a little dab of it. Look at the grapes. There's millions of them. But we brought back one cluster. Look at the figs and the pomegranates. But we just brought back a couple. Look how good they are. Look how great they are. It's a great land. 
there's a price we're going to have to pay if we go there. Instead, Caleb said, y'all shut your mouths. Let us go up at once, for we are well able to overcome it. That's the spirit that gets on you in the Holy of Holies. There ain't no doubt in the Holy of Holies. There ain't no fear in the Holy of Holies. All there is is the clearest picture of the promise that you've ever experienced in your life. Forty-five years pass. Forty-five years pass. Moses is dead. And Joshua is the leader. And Caleb comes to Joshua, says, I know you got a lot going on right now, but don't forget, I still want my mountain. I still want my mountain. If somebody will just let the hunger, let the hunger for more invade your life. Let the hunger for the promises, for that one touch that you had 27 years ago when you remember you fell on your face before God and you wept until you had no tears left, until you cried and your voice was hoarse. If you'll just revisit that and say, Lord, I'm not satisfied with just one isolated here or isolated there, but I want to live. He said that I come that you might have life which we all have. But then he said that you might have it. That's what I'm wanting, Brother Terry. Hallelujah. We can't be satisfied with just a little bit here and a little bit there. We want our promise. I want those signs that shall follow them that believe. I want, Brother Pete, he said, oh, we preach it because it sounds good and it sounds cool, but Brother Terry, he said, don't get too excited about the things you've seen me do because you're going to do them. How can we not see that there are promises? There is powerful manifestations of the Holy Ghost. We hear about it on the foreign fields. Them poor people that don't have the proverbial pot nor window. The little baby's bellies is all swelled up from hunger. The dead are raised. The blind eyes are open. The lame walk. Mighty miracles Mighty miracles are performed. It's because the Laodicean spirit has crept into our lives. And furthermore, it is affecting our prayer life. It is here. We talked about it the other night. Brother Pete, it is here. It, we are, we've got to shake ourselves out of our apathy. And listen to the prophetic word that he said the spirit says to the church. You think you're rich? Increased with goods and have need of nothing. When in reality you're blind, poor, wretched, and naked. If you think that's confined to the world. Oh, I won't be free from the afflictions of my mind. I don't want to. I no longer want to be controlled by the inadequacies of this body that has failed me. But I want to be fully confident in the power of God. Some trust in horses. And some in chariots. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Hebrews 4 and 16, Brother Shannon. We got this scripture all jacked up in our minds. 
We think, as I said earlier, that we can just roll out of bed and come boldly before his throne. Demanding. Presumptuous. You hear me right now. I'm in the Holy Ghost. Arrogant in our demands. Like spot rotten little children. Falling in the floor, throwing tantrums if we don't get our way. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. I would submit to you that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I would submit to you that this boldness will be in operation after we have met the Lord. Because when you come face to face with the Lord, now please hear me right now. There, I know there's been some that have said they don't even understand what I'm teaching. That's okay. That's, that's not against the rules. That is not. It's okay. But the power that I gain from the process We, Brother Pete, y'all got to see it. The mentality of the world has crept into our Christian life. We think we can drive through and get anything just like that. If you want a hamburger, you just go drive through it. I dare say drive throughs wasn't even heard of when some of you were little children. We go get a hamburger that somebody grabs out and throws on the grill. Brother Terry, they used to have, if they want a hamburger, you kill a cow. But we don't have to go through the process anymore, Brother Pete. So we just think that's how it is living for God. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It is when we meet the Lord that there's a change that takes place in our lives. That, my friends, is when all nine gifts begin to be in operation. Tongues and interpretation is not the only gift of the Spirit. There are nine of them. I can't list them all off to you, and I'm ashamed I can't right now, but the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, diverse tongues, tongues and interpretation, the gift of faith. They'll begin to be operation. That's not for the ministry. This, what I'm teaching to us, has nothing to do with being a preacher or not. I tell you what. Brother McKinney, this is give new. I want you to think about this. I'm, get, I'm done. Let's stand. Gifts will be in operation. Strongholds come down. Holy Ghost filled men and women will begin to speak the storms. Demons will be cast out. Our level of effectiveness in the world and in the church will increase. It will increase. Just everyday men and women will become powerful men and women of God. Brother McKinney, I'm going to leave you with this. There's a scripture that I've never really understood. I've never really understood it, but I believe it's becoming more clear to me through this. The Bible says, if the righteous scarcely be saved. Now, that's never made good sense to me. Why 
would the righteous scarcely be saved? Because they begin to think they're righteous. And Isaiah told us, Brother McKinney, that our righteousness is as filthy rags. The Holy of Holies. Meeting the Lord. Oh, God forgive me. And I, I know I've made myself vulnerable to you all at times, but there have been times in my life when my prayers were so empty. Oh, God have mercy, they were so empty. Oh, oh, I didn't have no more hope of getting anywhere with God than a goose in a hailstorm. No hope because I was just aimless. Oh, Lord, by the way, before I forget, say, well, I don't believe that. The Bible tells us that there are people that ask things of God that ask amiss because it's all about them instead of him. The prevailing thought of this prayer pattern is getting it about him. That's why we begin at the beginning praising him. And then I go to the next step where I crucify me. Boy, I tell you what. We're going to have revival. And I'm telling you, not only are we going to have revival, but we're going to have a great power, a great move of evangelism. And there's going to be souls filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. You just stay with me right now, just for just a second. I know, I know I've made you stand up for like five minutes. Due to ineffective prayer life, many of us have lost our passion for what the Holy Ghost can do. We have lost our faith. In the power of the Holy Ghost. Because when you don't see it happen. Case in point. We're fickle people. One of the things I thanked him for. And I thanked him for it. And I thanked him for it. And I thanked him for it. Because Brother Petey's been so long suffering toward me. But he has been impressing on me for. I know 25 years. I'm going to say maybe that's probably about right. I would have been 15. That the only thing separating anybody. Is, but he was talking to me. The only thing separating me from being where I knew I could be in God was having an effective prayer life. And I won't tell you how stupid I was. I ain't a lot smarter now, but I'm learning. After 25 years. Sister Eloise, you know what I told the Lord? When I get married and settle down, I'm going to start praying like I'm supposed to. Just something to think about. I'm ashamed. i got to ask the Lord to forgive me that it's taken me till I was 40 years old. To really learn what prayer. I, I would venture to guess that if I asked tonight for every man, woman, boy, or girl that has a prayer life you're satisfied with to raise your hand, there would be very few hands raised in the house. All I'm asking you, all I'm asking you is put it to the test. Just try it. Try it. You have nothing to lose. Amen. Guys, I'm sorry I didn't preach the house of fire on the night you're getting baptized. Not really, I'm not. I preached under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Sister Eloise.
We're going to baptize these two gentlemen in Jesus' name tonight. They showed up early, ready to be baptized. I've been praying for Brother Mark to get the Holy Ghost. He's been having some difficulty, and I've been praying for him to get the Holy Ghost. And I've, I believe if his faith is enough that he'd come out of the water filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. I believe that. I believe it. I've been praying that way. Uh, I know it's getting late. It's 828 already. But uh, I, uh, I, I'm going to try out my new robes tonight. I don't get to wear one. Amen. But that's all right. I don't want to anyway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If uh, Brother Mark and Brother Greg, if y'all want to come start getting ready, I took my stuff back over there on the other side and left it. If you come play the, play the piano, you know we got to have music at a baptism. I don't know how they did it back at Little River when they used to baptize people. They sang probably without any music. But uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to baptize both of these guys. The Bible says you have to do it to fulfill all righteousness. You believe that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to know, I just feel like telling you, I love all of you. I brag on you. I brag on you to all my preacher friends. Both of them. No, I got them one or two more than that. But I love this church. I love this church. But there's a scripture where Paul's speaking, and he said, I am persuaded there are better things for you. And that's the spirit I'm preaching from. And it doesn't matter, Brother Billy. Here's the crazy thing is it does not matter how I want to preach it. Brother Pete, when I show up, it's the same burden. It's the same desire. We have got to be motivated. We have got to be motivated. We've got to be pushed. If we're not pushed, we generally won't go. We've got to be inspired. We've got to be pushed. We have got to be, we have got to be exhorted. And the Bible just happens to say, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Y'all sing some songs. Sing them real good and fast and sing the. Hallelujah. We're going to pray before we baptize these gentlemen in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pray the hand of the Lord be upon Brother Greg's life. We're going to pray that the, the Lord will guide his steps. We'll bring him all the way where he wants to go. If y'all seen the notes and stuff that he's been taking at home, full notebooks full of stuff for Bible study, really searching. These guys have been searching for the Lord for over a year before they contacted me. When I went in their house, they had all kinds of Bible books scattered around searching, searching. And I think they, Brother Mark told me, he said, I've been to church all my life, but I ain't never been to church till I came to this church. And uh, I'm grateful for that. Amen, aren't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Y'all pray with me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for Brother Greg. I pray, God, that you'll guide his steps. I pray from this moment forward, he is a completely changed person. Lord, I know you filled him with the Holy Ghost, and I know you've brought him a long way, but your word says, this it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, I pray the hand of the Lord is upon his life, God, and you'll lead him and guide him in every direction he needs to go, and I give you the praise for it. I give you the praise for it. Uh, I'm thankful, God, that you brought him our way, and I'm thankful, Lord, that we've been able to be what they need. Lead him to you, who are what everybody needs, uh, in the name of Jesus. Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Greg Arbell, I want to just thank you for your faith in the teaching of the apostles. I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins as you have received the gift.
Hallelujah. This is a miracle that Mark is here. And I want us to really pray. I believe God's going to do a miracle in this baptistry. I believe it now. I believe it. I'm not going to believe the report of the doctor. What is more, I believe. Now, Brother Mark, the Bible says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a gift, and it's promised to you. When you come up out of this water, if you feel something in your mind that, that sounds like it might even be baby talk or gibberish, that's the Holy Ghost trying to come out. It's a gift. You've repented of your sins, right? 